This morning's gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, if you would like to follow along. Let us together listen for God's voice. Now all of the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman... Having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Growing up, my family was part of a drum and baton corps called the Marian High Steppers. Yeah, you heard me right. High Steppers. We were all very involved in this organization. My sister was one of the feature baton twirlers, and my brother was one of the drum majors of the group. And we would travel on red school buses that my dad had helped paint with our logo and fancy lettering to march in parades and festivals and competitions all around Indiana, even into Ohio, Michigan, and sometimes Illinois. Our summers were full. At age six, when you could officially join the Corps, my best friend in the world, Brian Johnson, and I started carrying the banner bearing Marion High Steppers, Marion, Indiana, in bold red letters in front of the Corps as we marched down the parade route. And boy, were we proud. Sometimes when we would travel to the places that were a little further away, we would make a weekend of it. We would stay in a hotel or a dorm. We would eat at a fun restaurant and maybe even visit an amusement park. One time, when the Corps was in St. Louis for a competition, we spent the day at Six Flags over St. Louis. Now, this was like going to heaven for me. I loved roller coasters and the Tilt-A-Whirls and the Roundup. Do you remember that one where you get sucked against the wall? And funnel cakes and ice cream and arcades and midway games. You know, all of the things that now hurt my back and lighten my wallet and make me nauseous. But when you're a little kid, think of the spectacle of the place. When we got there, we were divided into groups, and we were given strict instructions about what time to meet for check-ins throughout the day and where we were to meet. And then we were told that the most important thing was to stay with your group and our chaperones. Even if your group is riding a ride, you don't want to ride, they said, Wait for them at the exit of the ride. Make sure no one gets lost. And with that, off we went. Each group decided on a different place to begin their adventure for the day. Now, I don't remember which direction my group went first, but I do remember that as we were waiting to ride a roller coaster, standing in one of the longest lines in the history of humanity, I suddenly realized that, well... I needed to, I I had to, well, let's just say I I had a need to get out of line or there was going to be a bigger problem. I really had to go. And no, it couldn't wait. And so 
my friend Brian, who also had the need to get out of line, we convinced one of the adults in our group to take us where we needed to go. After everything was taken care of, we returned to our group only to find, much to our surprise, that they were nowhere to be found. We waited for them for a bit at the exit of the ride, just like we were told to do, but they never came out. We had no idea where they went, and there was no way to get in touch with them. Now, young friends, this was the time before cell phones. This is the Stone Ages, you have to remember. So the three of us made the decision to strike out on our own for a bit. We had a blast. We went on all the rides we wanted to go on. The adult, Sam, that we were with, paid for all of the junk food we could ever want to eat. We played games and even won a couple of prizes. I think we got stuffed snake, stuffed animals. We weren't with our group, but all was well. Or at least we thought so. We didn't realize that time had passed so quickly, and we had missed one of the check-ins by uh, an hour or so. The adult decided that even though the check-in time had passed, we should probably make our way to the check-in point anyway. So as we approached the appointed place, I saw her. There was my mom. She was talking to a man from the amusement park. And she looked, well, worried, very worried. And when she looked up and saw me and Brian's mom saw him, they ran over to us and as she was squeezing the life out of me with a giant hug, my mom said, Brian, Sean, that's when I always knew things were getting serious. Brian, Sean, where have you been? I was worried sick. There are people out there looking for you. I don't recall what happened after that. I'm sure we likely had a really long conversation about following the rules and all of that. But one thing I know for certain, I didn't even know I was lost. But for those who cared the most for me, and for those who were looking for me, the time that I had been separated from the group to which I belonged was nerve-wracking and frightening. And once I had been located, that anxiety turned to joy Over the fact that I was now back and a part of the whole, the community was complete again. We were reunited, and the two moms rejoiced together. In our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus tells his own stories of things both lost and found, and the joyful celebrations upon their reunion. They're short stories that are probably fairly like fairly familiar to all of us, and they come to us in the form of a parable to make the hearers think, to consider something deeper than the obvious details of the story. It's much like many of the vignettes we have of Jesus teaching the crowds, the gospel writer starts by giving the reader a little context as to why this particular parable was told, or at least why the author thought it was important to include it in the text. In keeping with this pattern, the author of the gospel that we call Luke begins with these words. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to to Jesus to listen to him. Now let's be clear, this is a little bit of hyperbole, because clearly not all of the tax collectors and not everyone who had ever made a mistake, committed a misdeed, or somehow messed around and got themselves lost, as my mom would say, We're gathering around Jesus. In spite of that, the author clearly wants us to know something. As readers, it is important for us to understand the kind of people who are attracted to Jesus, as well as those to whom he himself seemed to be drawn. These tax collectors and sinners in our text, they're really ordinary folk. People who lived ordinary lives, who were trying to make ends meet and carve out a space for themselves. They weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but neither were they particularly unsavory any more than anyone else. They also weren't the first ones to be welcomed to the fancy dinners 
in the community or even the neighborhood gatherings if they were ever invited at all. So when Jesus spent time with them and shared table with them, with those people, there were others who would whisper and point and would question whether or not such behavior was fitting for someone who should be more concerned, more careful about appearances. It wasn't the people he was with that caused the consternation in the crowd, but it was his exuberant welcome of them that was criticized. And then, much like Jesus often does, he took the opportunity to to turn the tables on his audience, on his hearers. This time, he puts them at the heart of the story. The first parable begins, Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness to go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And the second begins, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Now, often, when reading and applying the lesson of these parables, readers, commentators, and preachers like me view God as the one who does the searching and the finding in these parables. And that indeed may be the case. Theologically, it makes a lot of sense. We know that God is the one who will never leave us or abandon us. After all, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have been told over and over again. And there are dozens of other passages in the corpus of Scripture that say similar things, that speak to such important truths. But this morning, I want to contend that in our context of this parable, these two parables, Jesus might be saying something different or something in addition to this truth. Perhaps here Jesus is telling his hearers about the unlimited mercy of God and that as members of the community, we are called to mirror God's passionate search to embody God's radical welcome for everyone. In addition, if we, the hearers, find ourselves in the midst of these parables, we will discover that we bear responsibility not only for the searching, here's the hard part, but also maybe for the losing and the finding and then the celebrating of the return of those who have been separated from the whole, especially if that separation was through negligence of the community or the result of purposeful and painful exclusion. The veracity of the search in this morning's passage by the one who realizes that something important is missing may seem over the top or excessive to those who do not understand the value of what is missing or the depth of the need to make sure that it is located. The shepherd risks the well-being of the rest of the flock and even his own health to search the wilderness for the lost sheep. The woman, who has misplaced one of her coins, turns her house upside down and looks in every corner of the house until the coin is located. This all may seem a bit much and even illogical to us. But consider how panicked we are when looking for the document that we have saved in the computer but simply can't remember what file we put it in. Or how we turn our closet inside out when we're looking for our favorite shirt that we just want to wear today. Or when we lose our keys or our phone or our wallet that we were sure we put right there just yesterday. If this is true for these inanimate objects, how much more thorough and frantic will the search be when we understand that the one who is missing, who is not included, who has traditionally been excluded, is one of the beloved? Friends, there are those out there who are separated from communities, from families, even from their true selves. They feel alone, abandoned, forgotten, frightened, 
and failed. Perhaps they have been told that their very being is unacceptable, that they are welcome as long as they don't love who they love or love how they love. Maybe their experience has shown them over and over again that their race, their nationality, their ethnicity is somehow less than, is undesirable or is incomplete. Or maybe they don't believe rightly, look right, or process information the way others think is normative. We could spend the rest of the day and probably on into to tomorrow speculating about the multitude of reasons for the isolation and the estrangement of people from communities. But the fact remains that there are those who experience this kind of separation right here in our neighborhood, in our city, and even in our congregation. And it likely has been one of you at different times in your life. But there is good news, and here it is. The beauty of these parables is in the searching, in the finding, and in the celebration upon the blessed reunion. The wonder of these stories is found in the challenge for us to turn away. There's a word for that, repentance, to turn away from old, familiar, and comfortable ways that often lead to isolation and exclusion of others. And if there is a turning away from one way, there is also a turning toward something new. A new way of seeing, a new way of living, a new way of being together, a new way of counting by finding the one that has been lost. This new way is a way of love, of mercy, of inclusion, of equity, of equality, of justice, of being in communion, of counting to one. For each one is one. And that's the charge before us as followers of Jesus, whose love knows no bounds and whose mercy is everlasting. It is before us as a community of faith working to shape our purpose, our witness, and our life together. And friends, the work you are already doing in this regard as a community of faith is beautiful. You've become a Matthew 25 congregation, pledging to work toward building congregational vitality, dismantling structural racism, and eradicating systemic poverty. You have become part of the Covenant Network, seeking an equity still not found, fully realized for the LGBTQIA plus persons in our church and society. It's part of the work that you have done and are continuing to do. But as we know, there is always more to be accomplished within this work and beyond. And it is up to us with God's help, to count to one, to notice those who are left out, left behind, cast aside, and then to turn toward them, to repent, and to make every effort to make sure that everyone is included and knows their importance, not because of what they have to offer as if they are some type of commodity, but simply because they are. They exist. And that is more than enough. Our community is only complete when all are included. For the beauty of the image of the divine is in full view when all know that they are already a part of it. So friends, let us continue the work of seeking out, of welcoming everyone. For only when everyone is finally fully included can the real party begin. To God be the glory. Amen.